<laughs> All right. What you see right here is my prop, too. All right. When we receive Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, we become vessel of honor. Everyone say vessel of honor. Well, you're like a big God cup. Okay, a God glass. You're a vessel, you're a container, and you're supposed to be filled with God. Amen. So say amen. amen. So we know that when a, a person grows up, they lose touch with God until they get born again. And then they become a clean container. But see, an empty container is still that, an empty container. You, so when you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, God fills you with his spirit. Now, I'm not talking about baptizing the Holy Ghost, speaking in tongues. I'm just talking about he fills you right on up with his, with his spirit. And the spirit is also likened unto water. The waters of life, okay? Amen. But how many know that you need to pray daily? Because if you don't pray daily, every time that you get up in the morning, you go through your, your routines, you go, to job, you go to work and stuff, it pulls a little stress and a little God out of you. And, you know, if you don't pray daily and get refilled, then it, next thing you know, you start to get drained. Now you're half full of it. <laughs> now that doesn't mean you lose your salvation. It just simply means that you need to stay full. Because if you don't stay full, weird things happen. What do you mean, Pastor Kerry? Well, not only do we feel drained if we don't pray daily, but we come into situations where they're stressful. Have you ran into a stressful situation? Okay, so don't dwell on it, pray about it, okay? Because, so here I got coffee and pepper, and I'm putting some stress on our life. Ah, out of this sack of stress. By the way, don't carry your burdens around. Learn to lay them down. Okay. So what happens, we're drained, we're not keeping everything going. This is what about 70% of Christians do. They only pray when something's gone wrong. No, you pray so that people, so with, nothing goes wrong, or at least minimizes, say amen. So would you like to drink from that pure water? No, it's full of all kinds of stress and frustrations, and you haven't learned to give it over to the Lord. And so what do we need to do? We need to go back daily and wash the stress out of us by getting filled and sitting under the tap and letting God just pour his presence back in you. I'm going to kind of fake it a little bit so we're not here all day. And then filled again with water. Here's what the enemy does. He likes to drain us. Now, everybody's at a different growth level. You have a different situation, every one of you. Some families are good. Some families are stressful. Things that you prayed, things that you can't change but pray about. And so we're all growing at different levels. So the key for us and our health is to meet with God so he keeps us what? Filled to overflowing. And you just keep going to God. He's never going to run out. Now, guaranteed, there's no trace of stress and sin because you washed by the water of the word. Give the Lord a praise, will you? Amen. you blessed yeah you know we're going to be talking about the call of God everyone amen how many know that God's calling people all over the world amen huh. my phone's buzzing hello God what Tell the people that you're calling them to prayer. 
and, and you want them to meet with you on a regular basis so that you can get them ready for the revival that's here? Why did you call me, God? I heard that a couple of days. You wanted to make sure you reminded me. You must know me. Well, Lord, thank you. All right. God bless you. Bye. Everyone say goodbye. goodbye. All right. Woo. Thank you, Lord. He wants me to teach you about the call of God. So let's get into it, all right? Amen. <laughs> all right. Let's get our scripture back up on the board and let's get into this. We've been teaching on new creation realities. And really, it's who we are in Christ. Remember, Satan has religion. He has all kinds of different flavors and everything. But we're not religious. We have a personal relationship with God. Amen. Focus is one thing that God is really working on. Getting his church to focus. Because how many here know that we're going to be going home soon? So we need to stay focused at the things that God has for us. Now how many know the world's full of all kinds of distractions? Oh, man. Oh, man. Now, if you get a chance to read Proverbs, I'm, I'm doing this for those coming in by, by, by video. When you read Proverbs and read Old Testament, now listen to me, it has to be done through the light of the New Testament. Do you agree? You can't just read the Old Testament because it, it speaks in enigmas and in generalities. So when it talks about wisdom, wisdom cries. But who really is wisdom? God. God is wisdom. Or Jesus. Amen. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Okay? Amen. And when James talks about it, you can hear him in the book of James. He says, let patience have her perfect work. You know, and who's patience? God is, see. And you know, and if you're just surface reading the Bible, you'll think he's talking about what's some special force. Let patience have her special force. You know, and that's where baby Christians are. Listen, who lives in our heart now? Because you asked him to come in. Amen? You didn't kick him out, did you? No, he's still in there, right? So he is everything. Let me quote a scripture. You want to write it down, and then we'll read our scripture up there. This is in uh, Colossians chapter 2, verse 9 and 10. I'll quote it. It says, For he, Jesus, is the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And, verse 10, you are complete in him who is the head of every principality and power which means when we walk in Christ Satan must bow his knee before the Christ that we walk in someone say amen, amen. he must you didn't get a fake Jesus you didn't get a little colored egg Jesus and you threaten him with it no you're surrounded filled full of God and that is unless you don't meet with them on a regular basis. Then you're going to be drained. We'll get a little polywogs and some, some coffee grounds and some pepper flipped on you. Stress and the, and the cares of this life. Choke the word and it becomes un, unfruitful. Okay, here we go. Proverbs. So what you're hearing is when it says wisdom cries, you're hearing God is crying to everybody. Let's bring it to the New Testament right now. Right today, God is crying to the world. He's crying out to the lost. He's crying out even to you and I that get closer to God. Get a little bit closer to God. Amen? All right. And so it's up to us to bring ourselves. Now, let me ask you something. Seth, you might want to be interested. How many of the people that Jesus healed when he was walking in his earthly ministry were saved? Just Seth, don't you guys answer it. How many were saved? That's right, brother. None. They came to Jesus as sinners. Jesus as people under sin. And see, here's where our mind thinks. Well, if we can't go to God and get healed if we have sin in our life. Who told you that nonsense? That's what Jesus is for, to get the sin out of our life. How many here know you got things in you you probably should get rid of, but you don't really maybe even realize they're there? Come on. That's why you go to God and says, Lord, work on me, adjust me, fix me, take things out of me I'm not aware that I am having. That's offensive to your people and offensive to you. Can you pray a prayer like that? 
Hopefully you do. You know, not only by when I go to meet with God, I ask him to fix me, adjust me, fill me, clothe me, get me ready. But when I pray for you, I pray for the same things that happen to you. God put it in their heart that they would come to you first and they would bear themselves so that you can refill them, refresh them, rejuvenate them. Say amen, somebody. And so listen, the Proverbs of Solomon, the son of David, king of Israel. Number one, to know wisdom and instruction. Who's that? God. Now remember, he's talking about Old Testament. So they did not know a personal God. They only knew someone that we could get them whenever they got out of line. So they had a, a kind of a, uh, a fearful relationship with God. To perceive the words of understanding, to receive instructions of wisdom, justice and judgment and equity. Does everybody here know what equity is? Look at somebody and say, balance. Yeah. Now we know that equity also means worth. So it has the Old Testament worth and balance. In other words, you say you're a Christian, but your worth and your balance also agrees with what you say. You're not saying one thing and your worth and your balance is a complete wreck. Look at your neighbor and smile. He's talking about himself. All right. So to receive instructions, wisdom, justice, judgment, equity, to give prudence. Everyone say prudence. Common sense. Prudence is common sense. You're not going to drive your car for a week on an empty tank. That's not common sense. You're not going to run around, act like the devil, come back on ch church on Sunday and expect God to bless the socks off of you. That's not common sense, you see. Pr and then it says, and prudence to the simple. Who's the simple, folks? Now, don't put to it. In. We are. We're humans. We have been trashed. I haven't finished reading that. Thank you. <laughs> Hello? Where's the, where, where's the words? <laughs> yeah, all right. Try it. No, right. Don't worry about it. It's too late now. Anyway, so the whole thing about it is, never get nervous up there. Anyway, so the whole thing about it is, is that when wisdom cries to us, we need to what? Listen, okay, God is always calling to you, to you, and he's whispering to you, and he's calling to you. Well, what's he calling? <laughs> Amen. Now, listen, how many here remember the rotophones that sat on your desk in the house, and you usually, you only had one, right? We call it a landline. And, and at times, maybe you're out working in the yard, or you're up on the other side of the house, and it rings, and it's ringing, so you're doing your best, put everything out, watch, get your hands all, just go over there, answer the phone, just to pick it up, and it's, hung, they hung up. Oh, yeah. You're that fun. Now we can carry a phone with us. That's the difference between the Old Testament and the New. Many times, we always get there late in the Old Testament. In the New Testament, we carry God, the phone, around with us. Hello. Amen. See the difference? People are not being taught what we have in the new covenant as much as we should. Because we're blending, still blending. Old and New Testament. Old Testament is like this. Let me, let me talk Old Testament to you. Well, God is putting me through the mud and crud because I disobeyed him. And now I'm in a flood. He's getting something good out of that. I asked God for healing and he gave me sickness. I asked God for blessings and he gave me pain. Oh, God is working all things together for my good. That's the kind of understanding the Old Testament people had. Hello. And they literally follow God in fear. I mean, think about this. One of the feasts just the humor of God is just amazing. One of the feasts is the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Does anybody remember hearing that? The Feast of Unleavened Bread, this is what it is, God. That is in a preparation for a week. Your job is every day go through your house, take all the dust, all the leaven, all the yeast, go through there and sweep everything up through your house for a week while you're celebrating the coming of the Lord. This is what the Feast of Unleavened Bread is, is to get rid of all the sin or leaven in the house. Okay? Old Testament, New Testament is, Lord, I'm sorry for my sin, and Lord, by the way, save my family. 
You just swept all the scent out of your house. <laughs> Didn't take you a week, did it? I'm, I'm interested. Religious people think they have to repent and feel really, really sorry for change to happen. Who told you that? Religion. Listen, always be sorry when you miss the mark. Say, Lord, I blew it on that one. And be open and honest. And God says, yep, we're moving on, though. Don't hang there. Now, let me be honest and talk to you. How many of you have ever felt like you, you did something that God was really mad at you and, and, and you frankly just feel out of sorts? Well, we all have. Remember, don't hang out there. You're going to blow it. You're going to make mistakes. Don't do it on purpose. Okay? But when you do... Don't hang in that negative brokenness. Say, Lord, I really blew it. Be honest as you can and say, Lord, help me up and not to do that again. You see, oh, Lord, if you get me out of this one, Seth, God, if you get me out of this, I'll never bug you again. <laughs> I actually prayed a prayer like that when I was a kid. Don't do that. All right, you're with me. Greetings to you, church family. How many have God in the inside of them? Today we're going to talk about getting ourselves sensitized to hear God's call every day. God is calling you to do something or go somewhere or to pray somehow in a certain way. Because you're valuable to God. Do you believe that? You're his arms and legs. We learned all of that. Eyes and ears. So we need to be functional in the earth and be able to carry out what God's calling is telling us. The Bible says for us to walk worthy of the calling to which we were called in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 1 and 2. Okay? But in this calling, we need to find out. So I'm going to cover four things. What four things, Pastor Kerry? Number one, hearing and answering the call. Number two, living and being in the will and with God. Amen. Thirdly, examples of, of the call. We're going to use the example of Jeremiah, his calling, and, and uh, also, who else am I going to use? Maybe Moses or something. And then fourthly, don't resist God when he calls. Now, I, I did that. God told me I was going to be a pastor. I told him, no, I want to be an evangelist. I don't want to sit with the people and have to babysit. Now, this is me. This is not what I think. This is not what I, I am. But just listen. This is how I thought. Lord, I don't need any more kids. <laughs> just think how full of myself I am. And Lord, I, I want to be an evangelist. I could go right on and stir up everybody and leave. You know? <laughs> I don't want to sit, stir up everybody and then sit around. No. God called me to be a pastor. Everything I do, everything I say is pastoral. In fact, one guy used to call me pastoral. <laughs> I told him, no, I'm a senior pastor. <laughs> anyway, it doesn't matter. God made me that. I didn't make me that. But you can tell the gifts in people because of the things that they flow in. Amen. You can tell I have a gift to gab. You know, we won't move right past that one. So open your Bibles again to Proverbs 1. Look at verses 20 to 23. So the four, the four things again, hearing and answering the call, living and being in and with God. Three examples of the call, how people took it. And then fourth, don't resist the call, okay? Say, I got it. I got it. All right. Look at verse 20, Proverbs 1. Wisdom calls out loud. Whose wisdom? Yeah. Every day he calls. How well are we hearing now? That's just what you need to do. Help me to hear, Lord. Okay. Wisdom calls out loud. She raises her voice in the squares. She cries out in the chief concourses. At the openings of the gates in the city, she speaks her words. Now, who's really talking? God. How long will you simple ones, will you love simplicity? For scorners delight in their scorning. That means mocking people and making fun of them. You know, I laugh with people, but I don't laugh at them. If you're a Christian and somebody, one of the people you think of the devil, something happens terrible, don't rejoice in it, the Bible says. Because they were human, something happened, their life is trash, and you're laughing at it. Mm -mm -mm -mm. That'll cut you the power. 
Remember, I'm here to teach you on what cuts the power, too. You're full of the power of God. Say, I'm full of it. But it will leak out all through your feet and your mouth and everything if you don't have some form of discipline. Amen. So it goes on further to say, how long will you simple ones, will you love simplicity? For scorners delight in their scorning, their fools, fools hate knowledge. Now you know what a fool is. They can't listen to truth. Okay? Turn at my rebuke, he says. Surely I will pour out my spirit on you. Now you know what wisdom is. It's God. Okay? Amen. I'll pour out my spirit on you. I will make my words known to you. Everyone say, I choose to listen to God. Now, folks, there's a lot of white noise out there. A lot of noise. A lot of distraction. People saying things. Oh, you could turn on. I mean, there's some wonderful prophets out there. And there's some wonderful, terrible prophets out there. And there's this and there's that. What do you do, Pastor Kerry? You go to God and you let God order your steps and pick out who and what you listen to. The Bible says, be careful what you hear. And the measure that you listen to that, it will be measured back again. So all you listen to is world complaints, frustrations. You need to be cleansed of that because pretty soon it will be always on your mind. Look at what happened the last two years with this COVID thing. The church forgot almost about God and started fighting and arguing and all that thing. And Satan's just having a heyday, sucking up all that negative energy. God got a hold of us, didn't he? Told us, I said, listen. Our job is not to criticize what is wrong. It's obvious. I call that stating the obvious. Here's another thing. Just because you can doesn't mean you should. See, God gave you freedom. And he said, we're all free in Christ to make our choices. But just because you can doesn't mean you should. All things through prayer. Okay, and then you'll get to go ahead. Amen. And man, total backing of God. I'd rather do something that God backs than do something I hope he'll, you know, he, he's a part of. Well, oh, Pastor Kerry, come on. No, do your th day, normal thing, but let God strain out those things that hurt you. All right, say amen. <laughs> All right, so it goes on. So who is wisdom? Okay, don't forget that. We must follow who? We must follow wisdom. Who is our shepherd? Jesus. Amen. The Lord is my shepherd. Help me out. Stop right there. Listen to that. The Lord is my shepherd. When I let God shepherd me, he takes care of all my need and wants. So the last thing you'll hear coming out of my mouth is I don't have this and I don't have that. Why doesn't God come through here? Why does the Lord is my shepherd? I shall not. There you go. He leadeth me. He leadeth me. He leadeth me. And though I walk through the valley of shadow of death, he is with me. Folks, we're in the New Testament. He's with you and in you and for you and goes before you, stands behind you, and clothes you. So what's the devil doing? He's conning you to stay religious. No prayer, not in the word. You're caught up in your neighbor's business. Now, I'm not talking about you, but this is what the enemy does for us. Isn't that wonderful, wonderful things? Yeah, and then we think we're a savior. We go around telling everybody what God told you because you're the only one who hears from God. That isn't right. Listen, it's a chain of command. Do you think I'm dumb, deaf, and blind? Remember the joke I made about being the mouth? <laughs> you know, the two guys would say, what are you in the body of Christ, Pastor Kerry? I'm the mouth. But, but that was a joke. I'm the eyes and the ears. I know what two years from now is going to look like. Why don't you trust me to help get you there? That's my job. Oh, no, Pastor Kerry, you don't know hardly anything, so I'm going to help you out. Do me a favor and stop. Just do, do what God wants you to do. Okay? Hello? I can hear God's voice right even now. You see, so clear and everything. So I don't need you, although I like for you to pray and seek God for us. But, but remember something. My wife and I hear from God very clearly. 
and you pray that we always hear from God. And then if God gives you something which truly is from God, we want him to, it should confirm what the head knows. The finger doesn't think for the head. So if you ever hear something and you think nobody else gets it, not of God. It's not of God. It may, may seem like it, but it causes divisions and make other people feel stupid. God doesn't do that. It makes all people feel welcome. Hey, by the way, we're going to get a, a, a sign. It's going to say when you come to the, to the church, welcome home. Welcome home. Do you feel like this is kind of your home? Yeah. Of course you do. Welcome home. God's presence, God's goodness. You know, it's just a building, but welcome home to the presence and the goodness of God. Let me take a sip. Hallelujah. All right, hearing and answering the call. Go with me to John chapter 10, please. I don't know why it didn't ring. It was supposed to ring. <laughs> We had a nice ring for it. John 10, look at verse 1. Most of you know this, but I'm just going to emphasize the points that deal with the call, okay? Most assuredly, Jesus is talking here. I say unto you, he does not enter the sheepfold, get saved by the door, Jesus Christ, but climbs up some other way, that's the devil, the same as a thief and a robber. But he who enters by the door, that's you and I, is the shepherd of the sheep. So here, let me break it down. Jesus had to be born here naturally in order to have a say here in, in the spirit realm. We have to be born of the water and of the blood. So we come out of a sack of water and then we receive Jesus and we're cleansed by the blood. Can you say amen? So Jesus had to be born here. He had to walk here. He had to die here in order to have a say here. When he did, he set a covenant that's in such a place that you and I can't destroy it. The covenant's forever sealed. The Father God and Jesus representing man cut a covenant and he bled and it's been sealed. There's nothing that can stop the goodness of God. Say amen. And remember, your New Testament, so God is not going to rain hell down on you because you did something wrong. You are his kids. He chooses, now listen to me carefully, he chooses to pull us aside when we do something wrong and cuddle us and impress upon us the correction. He doesn't slap us around and let the car hit you and remind you how stupid you've been. Say amen. Well, Pastor Kerry, it says all things work together for good. Yeah, to them that love God. Not just everything that happens. I have several friends that died in car wrecks and airplanes. Do you think that was God? Well, God got good out of it. Boy, I tell you what, he had to work. Don't be thinking that way. Who lives in you? Didn't he give you all things to pertain to life and godliness? Didn't he give you all things right in here? Now when you hear the scripture, all things work together for your good. It's not talking about out here. It's talking about the goods in you are working together for your good. Who's in you? Who's working for your good? See, you can tell how religion would want to take that scripture and, and it does include whatever God, whatever happens to you, God can get some good out of it. It does include that, but that's the least of its interpretation. The big interpretation is what God put in you will always work together for your good. Now, start living from the inside out. Amen. I said, Amen. And that's the problem. We're not living from the inside out. We're living from the outside impulse. And somebody calls you a jerk and now you're getting coffee and, and black pepper in your, in your vessel. You take it to heart. Your whole life is broken. Why did they do that to me? To me? To me? To me? To me? They're doing it to me. You see? Satan's crafty. No, it isn't about us. He's trying to shut down anybody that has a smile on his face. All right. 
Let's get into this. So 10, it says, Surely I said to you, he does not enter the door by the sheep pole, but climbs up some other way. You know, that's the devil. But he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. Now, I, I, to him, the doorkeeper, the Holy Spirit opens, and the sheep do what? They hear his voice. Sheep, that's a term for a, a believer. We hear whose voice? Okay, so how do we hear voices proper enough? I don't know about you, but when I was taught how to tell counterfeit money, when I was, I was shown how to tell whether it's counterfeit or not, it's by feel. And so you handle real good money, and then they slip a, a fake money in there, and you can tell the feel is different. What I'm trying to say is we need to get close to God, so close, we are conditioned and we know how his presence feels, if I have to use that, how that feels. And then when a counterfeit comes along or something that's not of God, you can tell right away that it truly isn't of God. Hey, I want to give you this Cadillac. No engine, but I thought you might have it sit in front of your house in case somebody else's house. <laughs> See, not everything that looks good is good. That feel of you are getting used to God helps you separate what is of God and what is not of God. Say amen. amen. So we need to know his voice and we need to follow him. And what is Jesus, our shepherd, doing? He's leading us out. First, he took you out of darkness, put you into light. Second of all, he's helping you renew your mind so you begin to think right. Say amen. Because when you think right, you begin to act right. And when you begin to act right, you become righteous in God's actions. Hello. Amen. But you see, because we are out of phase. Everyone say out of phase. When Adam and Eve fell, they fell out of phase. They fell into a three-part being. Spirit, soul, and body. And yet separated from God. Now their body has its own dictations. Their mind has their own dictations. And their spirit feels cuddled down and, and, and all broken. And now we see Adam, the mighty Adam of God who named all the animals, hiding in the bushes, clothing himself with weeds. Pig leaves. What happened? Satan moved Adam, the human race, out of phase. Folks, when we get into harmony with God and we begin to worship and sing with God, God moves us back into phase. Ooh, spirit God begins to move. We're not disjointed. We're not, we settle down. We open up. We ask cleansing. And now we move right back into phase. Folks, what happens? God lifts the binds on your mind. Suddenly you could be creative and think. He lifts the binds on everything else so that you are now a spiritual person and not a carnal sold under sin. Say, oh me. <laughs> All right, so we need to be sensitized to God's voice. In order to do that, okay, we need to stay consistent. Sherry knows this word. <laughs> be consistent. Folks, it's the consistency, exposure to God that changes you. Okay, it isn't what you do or don't do. It's your exposure to God and the consistent more exposure you get, the more like God you become. So that's why the enemy keeps you from praying. It makes you feel like you're 100 pounds of sin on a popsicle. Oh, I talked to God today. I failed him so bad. Please do talk to God. Amen. We are going through Jesus Christ now when we live. It says, in that day, you will approach my father through me, through me. So we accept Jesus, and then we move in the spirit towards the father in Jesus. Can you say amen? Every day we get up, we meet with the father, he closes us in Jesus, we walk through our day in Jesus. Our father is pleased because we're lifting him up. Jesus is in the forefront. Jesus is leading us. Folks, sit down and let God do the guiding. Well, if I sit down, then I can't work my job. That's not what he's talking about. He says, be quiet, sit down, know God is God, and then walk with him as he walks you through your schedule. You want to have a good job, a good day? I've had perfect days. What's a perfect day? When God did everything in it. And all he did is kind of watch what he was doing as I was going through my routine. Wow! 
know. Anybody ever experienced something like that? You should. Should, should be something. You're God's child. Yeah, but I'm still down here. Well, listen, just because you're down here doesn't mean down here is going to influence you. You influence down here. You get so heavenly minded, you can change your surroundings. Say amen, somebody. All right. Second thing, living and being in and with God. Go with me to Galatians chapter 5, please. We're going to look at verse 22 through 25. When you got up this morning, what was the first thing you said? Good morning, God. Or was it more like this? God, good morning. <laughs> Greet him. He's right there. Greet him. Let him know you're aware of him. And all your ways acknowledge him or be aware of him. And he will direct your path. If you're not aware of him, then you're going to direct your path. So make yourself aware of God. Folks, do you know I, I can whistle barely, but I, I, I love to whistle. I could whistle and shatter eardrums, you know. But, but nowadays I, I, I can't really do that. But you know, sometimes people will whistle to make themselves happy, right? Or laugh or crack a joke to make themselves happy. Not every time you get up in the morning are you going to be happy. So greeting God and saying, God, you love him and appreciate them. He infuses you with his joy. And that joy just bubbles right on up. And suddenly you find yourself content and happy because you greeted God first. Say, oh, me. All right. But the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, long suffering, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. Against such there is no law. The law was made to demand us to be guilty of our sin and to repent. And those who are our Christ have crucified the flesh. Did you see that? How many here belong to Jesus? You crucified your flesh? Here, here's one. Don't get mad at me. But why do you have to get up in the middle of a congregation and go out and smoke? You need to crucify your flesh. That cigarette's become a god. If it has control over you, people that drink, if you can't stop drinking, that's become a god, a demigod. You've given too much attention to that. Hello? Well, what does that do? It opens the door for enemies' attack. Hello? Remember, I was raised in the moonshine family. Hello? My mom made moonshine. She taught everybody in her club how to make moonshine. What do you think I drank when I was a kid? Yeah, who do you think had all the friends? <laughs> Until the moonshine was gone. And then when I discovered the pot, <laughs> my sister, bless her darling heart, she corrupted me, but I forgive her. You see, we often look for things to satisfy that longing in our heart that only God can meet. Amen. Come on. And so nothing else will do. Okay. So again, if you're looking for some kind of action to satisfy you and you haven't been a person of prayer, go be a person of prayer and God will fill your life with things that satisfy you. Hello. Amen. So we live in and we live with God. All right. So if the fruit of the spirit, where does God live? In us. So what should be evident in a believer more than anything else? Love. Hello. For the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, long suffering, meekness, gentleness, patience, and faithfulness. I think I got all night. It doesn't matter. That's working in us. Now the fruit of the spirit is God is Christ. But the fruit portions of love and joy are parts of him coming out of your life. When's the last time you had a good laugh? Hello? Yeah. This morning? Yeah. Hello? A good, good chuckle for God. Mm -hmm. Amen? I call it a chuckle offering. 
I've been in meetings where the spirit of joy came in and just so many people needed just to be refreshed. It was like a wind came in. I didn't say they all end up laughing and rolling around or anything like that, but they ended up laughing. Everybody was laughing. We had, a, we had a birthday party for Scott. I show up there and all of a sudden God says, here, receive some joy. <laughs> Went bizarre. Anyway, it was great. God does things wonderful. Love and joy, peace. You should be having peace. Right in the middle of a storm, because you love God and you're walking with God, you will have peace in the middle of everybody's turmoil. And somebody says, well, how can you sit there so nonchalant? Just say, because I'm dwelling in God and God is not troubled about this. You are troubled about this, so you're, you're in the danger zone. You see, when we get troubled about things, it affects our spirit. Satan knows this. Your spirit has God in it. But your spirit is not meant to be toshed like that. Oh God, what am I going to do? We're just troubling our spirit and it says troubling it. The Bible says people get sick because they trouble their spirit too much. We're talking about where God lives. Christians get sick because they get all troubled about things and they start talking about it and get all involved in it and it begins to trouble the peace of God in their heart. And the Bible says if you can keep your spirit untroubled, you're harder to destroy or fight against than a strong armed city. That means God's protecting you. So don't get caught up in the affairs of the world because you're not the Savior. You pray for the affairs of the world and then you give it back over to God. That's our weapon. Amen. Now, you don't see me marching around the church with a sword over my shoulder, do you? Waiting for you to get out of hand so I can whack you with it. No, I pray for you every morning, give you to God, and then I watch God completely carry it out. I pray for you every day and ask God to give you, give him invitation to go in and help you with every project, help you to grow, help you to open your eyes to see the things he has for you, and Lord, to let the things of the past go. Every day I do that. Why do you do that, Pastor Kerry? Because I don't want a troubled convocation. Because <laughs> people, people are wonderful, but the, the biggest problem that congregations have is people. They didn't get their way. They wanted it this way. And they wanted it that way. You know better because you're taught better. But you know how that is. Now, I don't know if you've ever had more than one child. But people have five kids, six kids, four kids, you know. And they're arguing over each other. How pleasant is that? <laughs> you bet. Let's go on. So, see, I dwell in God. I walk in God. And God walks in me. I need to be at peace and let him rule my life. How many here have Jesus as your Lord? Stop making the decisions for him. Just go to him and say, Lord, today I know I have to do my job. I have to do these things. But Lord, is there anything else you want me to do today for you? Let me know during my routine. Thank you, Father. God says, right on. And next thing you're going through your routines. Might, might sound, seem, and God says, pray for this person. Or he might say, go over here and, and, and talk to that person. I mean, that's where those wonderful things happen. And you say, well, why do those happen? Because we're no longer tormented over our own problems. And now we can listen to God and his instructions. So don't be tormented with problems. Give them to God. If they're too big for you to do something about, he's big enough to handle it. Don't try to do something when you cannot do something. Like, for example, say you have a child. It's a wayward child. You can love them. You can care for them. You can be supportive. Don't get in arguments with them. But you can pray. And God knows how to reach them. Can you say amen? Let's use God's weapons. Let's use God's wisdom. Let's hear the call of God as he calls us closer to him. My third point, examples of the call of God. Go with me to Jeremiah chapter 1, please. Anybody know here anything about the prophet Jeremiah? Well, he was called the weeping prophet. And he wept all the time. He was broken and wept all the time because of Israel. Israel split and became Judah and Israel. Remember the two kingdoms? And he just wept and cried over the backslidings of God's people. Now, he's Old Testament, 
But when God chose somebody, now everyone say prophet. So just so like I can explain it to you. God, if you want to move prophetically and in the power of the spirit, you can't be loose with your lips. You can't talk about silly things and gossip and tell, tell everybody a tale. Let me tell you what my neighbors are doing. Why? <laughs> okay, you understand? <clears throat> we learn to speak right once we do. Now listen, here's God calling Jeremiah. In chapter 1, look at verse 4. Then the word of the Lord came to me saying, Before I formed you, in the womb I knew you. Before you were born, I sanctified, set you apart. I ordained you a prophet to the nations. Then he said, this is Jeremiah now, Oh, Lord God, behold, I can't speak. I'm but a youth. But the Lord said to me, Do not say I'm a youth, for you shall go to all to whom I send you. And whatever I command you, you shall speak. Do not be afraid of their faces. Sometimes people can't look you in the eyes. You're talking and representing God as an ambassador. Look them in the eyes and speak to their heart, not their head. You can't argue with somebody who thinks they're right. But if you tell them, hey, how come you're so broken hearted in your heart? Immediately they stop thinking they're right all the time and go to reflecting personally where they're at with God. Say, oh me, somebody. Yeah. So never talk to somebody's head unless you're doing business and stuff. But if you're trying to win somebody to the Lord, talk to their heart. Talk to them in their lonely spots and things that God gives you to talk to them about. Amen. That's what got me. It wasn't all the love of Jesus and all that kind of stuff. It was knowing I might go to hell and, I, and I'm really in bad shape. And coming to that honesty myself. You with me? So Jeremiah says, look, I'm a, I'm a youth. I can't do all this. But God knows whom he chooses, right? Do you remember how he chose King David? Huh? He went to what? The prophet Samuel went to Jesse's house. And, and he says, give me all your sons. I want to see what you got here. God says, there's somebody here that's, that God's called to be the next king. And they went through all the boys. He wanted to anoint the first one, the second one. He says, so we look at the outward man. God looks at the heart. Amen. What was David doing? He was tending sheep. What, what am I doing? I'm tending sheep. The only reason God put me in the place that I'm in, and God had to do it, is I got a heart after his people like a shepherd. If you, if you hate people, you're not going to call to the ministry. <laughs> I mean, if you can't stand to be around them. I seek ministers. After the service is over, their bodyguards pick them up, move them right on out. You can't see them, can't talk to them. That's not, you're never going to have that from me. You can talk to me as long as you respect me. You can even correct me, say, Pastor, I think you're wrong in that area, but I have great respect for you, you see? But it's that disrespect and that thing, when we show that, immediately everything shuts down because Satan is near. He pushes, he causes problem, God flows. All right, say, oh me. All right. And what did he call Jeremiah to do? This is what he's called us to do, to root up, to pluck up, to remove, and to plant. Now, we've got a government situation, bless our heart, we are to pray for them and to love them. But there are things that we're not, a lot of us people are not happy about. You are the God people. Pray it changes in Jesus' name. Without railing on, without getting caught up at all, all this stuff. Don't forget those people on the YouTube. They're going to say something provocative and say something wild just to get the clicks. Because when you click, 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 they get attaboy, 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 and their, their stuff gets to be seen more. Would to God that you clicked a million times on these broadcasts so that YouTube gives us click favor. That's how it operates. So when you see a thing like that, click thumbs up. If you're not prescribed, you can watch it when you want to or not. 
But when you do that, you are telling them that this is a good program for them to continue to air. Did you know that? Okay, you do now. Oh, Lord, we're but children. You read about what God did with Jeremiah. Now, we're New Testament, folks. God is not using so much the prophets. He is. He's using the body. And you'll notice that the fires of God are happening in places where everybody said it wouldn't happen. College campuses. High schools. Hello, little teeny churches like this. Where people are focused, where God can pour out his spirit. Remember, when you're thirsty, and there's a lot of thirsty people out there, they need to hear there's a well here and come and drink. They're not going to hear about it if you don't tell them, if you don't invite them. I'm certainly not going to, because it sounds like a brag if I do it. Moving right along. So Jeremiah said, yes. How about Samuel? Do you remember Samuel? Remember the story of Samuel? I'll, I'll paraphrase it for you. What was happening is the prophet Eli was a not very responsible or very good prophet. He didn't have his family in order. His kids were fornicating all the time, even to the point of going right up to the steps of the temple and doing that. And it says the word and the lamp of the Lord went out. And there was no open vision at that time for Israel. Why? Because the prophets were supposed to give the word. And this one prophet, all he can do is barely hold his family together. Uh-huh. Okay. And it says that God actually visited him and gave him another 15 years after he repented. But it says it went out. And so God needed another prophet that would obey him. And it says of Samuel that he was a prophet that none of his words fell to the ground without coming to pass. Boy, that just killed him, didn't it? <laughs> Do you hear what I said? Are you even here? All right. You know, don't talk like that. Don't speak death about life. Don't, hello? Don't speak life about death unless you're resurrected. Anyway, it says that God called him Samuel. So he, he, oh, he got up and went over to see, Eli, did you call for me? How many times did he do it? Three times. How many fingers am I holding up, dear? Okay, she'll say two. The idea is, the idea is God, so he got up. It wasn't Eli, went to bed. God called him again. He got up, went to Eli again. And Eli says, no, go to bed. And he says, next time you hear it, say, here am I, Lord. God wants to talk to you. He wants you to meet with him. When you do, say, here I am, Lord. Use me however you feel. Guide me. Fill me. Here I am, Lord. Can we say that together? Here we are, Lord. I'm right here to be used of you. Yeah, God loves that. And so they called, and finally it said that he answered the call. Eli says, sit down and call, answer the call, and God raised him up. If you know the story, he was that boy that the, the Shunammite woman, he had died. And the prophet came out of the land there, and, and he said to the woman, woman is all well. Now her, she just, her son had just died of sunstroke. Went out to meet his father in the field, died of sunstroke. And he's laying in the bed dead. And the prophet says, how, how is everything? She says, it is well. Now, was it well? But she's confessing her faith. It is well. He, he knew in the spirit. He went up, laid his whole body on the boy, breathed on his face, his fingers on his fingers, his feet beat, and the anointing went right into him, raised him from the dead. Samuel the prophet. And then she gets, said, if, if you save my son, I will dedicate him to the service of the Lord. There you go. I'll give you a little history there. And God loves that. Did you know you have more value, more value to God now than Samuel did then? Even said, of all the prophets, John the Baptist was the greatest of all the prophets. Yet one person in my kingdom is better than all of them. That's what Jesus said. 
Why? Because we're indwelt by God. It's time we be student and trained by God, conditioned to move in the spirit. But the church has been playing church for so long, now you begin to see the fires of God all over. And God is calling us. Will you answer the call? Let's go to my last point. What happens to us if we ignore the call or resist the call? You guys remember Jonah? I, yeah, boy, what a nasty thing that was. Anyway, let me just talk about it for a minute. There are people you know in your family that, that God is calling them to him. And they're resisting. And what's happening is getting sick. They're doing dumb things. I mean, because they're not answering the call and following God. So if you've got children, grandchildren, great-grandchildren that are not answering the call, and you know that God is calling them because you prayed for them, you've given them to God, then you ask God to remind them what happens to those who run from the call. Okay? Now, God won't do anything bad to anyone. But when we run from, when God's trying to draw us near him, when we run from him, whose hands do we put ourselves in? And it isn't God's. So I know several people that need to be in church here that God is literally pulling them. A husband and wife belongs to one of the people here trying to pull him here. And he's resisting and he's going through all kinds of stuff because we can't resist the call. All right, let's talk about Jonah. What did God tell Jonah to do? Go to Nineveh. Amen. Nineveh were where the fish head people were. They worship a demigod that literally had a fish head that came from the water. I forget what their names were. Okay. You notice the Catholic Church wears those little fish heads. Because they're part pagan and they're part Christian. Oops, I'm sorry. Fish heads. They worship up a fish demigod. And Jonas, I don't want to go and talk to those nasty people. I don't want. To, I don't even like them. And so, what does he do? He heads somewhere else. Hello. And then he decides to get way away. And so he gets on a ship and the ship goes through all kinds of stuff. The waves and everything to make a long story short. This is Old Testament. God was trying to tell Jonah, you're going the wrong way, buddy. And somehow somebody on the ship, I'm just making it quick. Got the idea that the problems they're having has to do with this Jonah guy. Let's get rid of him. Let's toss him overboard. Hello? Now, you got to go back, way back in those days. Nobody had any regard for anyone else. That's why the world was so bad. So you say, you're the cause of the problem. <laughs> what swallowed him? We think a fish or a whale. We really don't know. It's probably a whale. But can you imagine laying in a whale's stomach, all the stomach acid, bleaching his skin? You know, seaweed and fish smell. And then the fish swims right up to the shore of Nineveh and goes, bleh, and he pops out. Now, folks, if you know anything now, about God's sense of humor, what, were, what was the God that these Ninevites were worshiping? A fish God. What did Jonah come out of? And God's sense of humor is so cool. Hello, Blah. and this guy comes out and he's got seaweed all over him. He's bleached completely, you know, just looks like he, his clothes are all ripped up. And he goes, repent. It said the whole nation repented because they knew. And I asked God about it. He says, they saw the God that they worshiped blow somebody out of his mouth and they figured he was a God. And when he said, repent and receive the God of the Hebrews, they did. Do you see the humor in that? Come on, folks. I like the humor about when the Egyptians rode across the, the Red Sea, remember? And it said, uh, on dry line, it says they rode across after the Israelites and then God collapsed everything. You know, but before... The, the water collapsed on him. The angels pulled the wheels off the chariots. Yeah. Read it. They pulled the wheels right off the chariots. And so they rode heavily. 
got caught in the sand, it just whoosh. That's your God. That's the one who lives in your heart. My goodness, it's time we just get going with things. There's a revival in the land. Where's your part? What are you doing? Amen. Don't be distracted because all that happened did happen. But God says what I have to happen will blow your minds. God said, I will do things that you have, people have not seen me do in this latter days. I will do miracles, signs, and wonders beyond the wildest imagination. But I'm looking for a people that are looking for me that will serve me and will not compromise. Will you be that people, saith God? So don't resist the call. Say amen. Amen. How many here remember a guy named Saul of Tarsus? I make this too because I'm, I, my preaching, my teaching, you got to pray. Oh, Gary, make it short, man. I got a lunch. All right. <clears throat> Saul of Tarsus. God weighs the heart. So let me tell you, Saul's heart was right. He was wrestling, if you read Romans 7, over the fact that he wants to be good, but sin was present in with him. He still has Old Testament, Old Covenant thinking. And he says, when I want to do good, I can't do good. But then God showed me how to be born again, how to walk from the inside out. I make it paraphrasing it. Hello. And so what we need to know is that Saul was a Jew. He was a top hit Jew. His job was to kill Christians and to persecute them and throw them into jail. He thought he was obeying God. How could he do that? Well, that's what the Jews are taught. Anything that causes rebellion, put them in jail, get rid of them somehow. Hello, to protect the covenant. Well, anyway, we know the story. He's on his way to Damascus on the road, and all of a sudden, God shined up. And so you got to know about God. He's very dramatic. Suddenly, a light opened up, a portal opened. I know, I'm going to use this modern term. I would say a portal, and God's light and power shined right on people. God could do anything he wants. He says he's going to roll up the universe like a scroll. So think about that for a while. Anyway, so he stepped in, hit him with light, light beam, bam, knocked him right off his horse. Folks, every time you get so full of yourself, God will knock you right off your high horse. So stay on the ground and stay humble and you won't get bruised so bad. <laughs> when he fell off the high horse, he couldn't see anymore. He went blind. And he had to be led around. He, he heard God clearly, but everybody else heard just the sound. What God tells Saul, 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 you're attacking me. When you attack these Christians, you are attacking me. And it's hard for you to kick against Almighty God. I'm paraphrasing, okay? He says, who art thou, Lord? He says, I am Jesus, you're persecuting. And so for three days, he was blind, didn't need anything. I call it a forced fast. And he went, and God began to reteach him the gospel from a New Testament standpoint. And that's why we have all those epistles of Paul. You know, Ephesians, and, and Galatians, and Philippians, and all of these different things. Because God gave Paul revelation for these end times for us. There are things that Paul taught in his scripture that Jesus didn't address. He couldn't. He didn't have the time. First of all, what is it? Well, God dwelling in us. The greatest thing that we have in the New Testament is we're indwelt by God. Complete different rule change. Because we're no longer sinners, we're children. Can you say amen? So stop blaming God for the bad and kick the devil out of your life. Someone say amen. Well, he ended up repenting and, and writing almost two-thirds of the New Testament. Now, Answer the call of God. God might say something today for you to do or say. Be, be listening. I get up every morning to listen to God. And you say, well, why do you do that, Pastor Gary? Because he made the universe. He made the solar systems. He made the laws that operate the earth. He created everything that is good. He, you know, and I want to get to know him better. 
I think about Enoch. I don't know. I, now, let me explain. The book of Enoch is not to be compared with Scripture. Neither, neither Asher or the book of Giants. These are all extra things. It's like Kenneth Hagin writing about the Scripture. Kenneth Hagin's books are not the Bible. So Enoch is a good book. You can learn a lot because it gives detail, but it's not canonized and it's not totally fully inspired. But you go to Genesis 6 and then you go to Enoch 6 and it completely matches. So something's up. And so we look for other things that bear witness. Now listen, you're living in the most modern, wonderful, godly times that ever could be. Because what is about to happen in the earth, you're going to be a part of. Unless you die tomorrow. <laughs> and you go, how many here are not planning? One of my prayers for you is you, I pray for the elderly here. God, add another 20 years to your life if you want to receive it. Can you say amen? All right. The Lord bless you, keep you, watch over you, help you to hear his call, to listen to his voice. Help step you through life and bless you beyond your wildest imaginations. Remember something, everybody. When God's blessing you, those blessings are not just for you. They're to pass on as God directs you. Hello? And as you pass on, you sow, you also, and you keep passing, and you keep reaping, and you keep passing, and you keep reaping. One day God says, come up, and we'll be gone. Lord bless you, keep you, watch over you, keep you healthy. May you have favor with your family. If there's been some kind of bad thing that happened in the past, may healing come and, and heal all that up. Maybe you'll be able to talk to your children, your grandchildren. May, be, may you be able to pray and feel free and secure. 